Hey guys, thanks for tuning back into Upgrade Addiction. Now, if you've been following the channel for a little while, you'll recall that we've done liquid metal replacements, thermal paste replacements, on a GTX 1080 and a Titan X. Some of you wanted to know what it would be like if we did that to a 1080 Ti, and especially one that already has a really effective cooler. So, why don't we go ahead and find out? In case it wasn't already clear, the card we're going to be doing the liquid metal replacement on is the EVGA GTX 1080 Ti for the Win 3 edition. This is currently EVGA's best custom board 1080 Ti, that is until the kingpin comes out, which needless to say, I'm pretty damn pumped for. Anyway, let me give you a quick rundown on the For the Win 3. Currently it retails for $1299 Australian or $779 US and it has a base clock of 1569MHz and a boost clock of 1683MHz and is packed with 11GB of GDDR5X memory clocked at 11GHz. But most of that is irrelevant because GPU Boost 3 will take it well beyond those figures even right out of the box as you'll see and then I'll overclock it manually as well. It also features dual BIOS and if you have one make sure that you use the slave BIOS not the master BIOS because for some reason the slave actually has a higher TDP limit, go figure. The For the Win 3 also has EVGA's new ICX cooling which is a combination of many things including the first ever triple fan cooler which by the way is a genuine two slot design and nine thermal sensors across the card measuring voltages and temperatures across various parts of the card as well as three LEDs mounted along the top edge which can act as visual references for the card's temperatures but in my case aren't that much use. And it also has a heavy and clean looking die cast backplate with RGB LED cutouts. But you know what? I wish this front plate was aluminium and not plastic. I mean it looks like it's metal but knowing it's plastic does affect its appeal slightly. It measures in at 143mm tall and 300mm long and it weighs 1.376kg. As always I'm going to use Thermal Grizzly's conductor knot because at this point I'm pretty familiar with it and it's what I've used in the other videos. As far as I'm aware conductor knot has the highest thermal conductivity of any liquid metal paste currently available and based on my previous testing it tends to be pretty damn effective. As far as the software goes, just to keep things in line with the other videos, I'll be using Unigen Heaven Benchmark to put load onto the card, but this time I'll be using EVGA's Precision X GPU overclocking software instead of my personal favourite MSI Afterburner. And why is that? Well, one of the party tricks of the FTW3 is asynchronous fan control, which basically allows you to individually control the speed and curve of each of the three fans. And because of this, MSI Afterburner only recognises one fan. So regardless of the fan curve or any settings I could find in Afterburner, the other two fans didn't spin up. A couple more things to take note of before we jump into the testing. The room ambient is set to 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans that might be watching. And the fan speed will be locked at 50% throughout the testing. I'll also be using NVIDIA's 382.53 driver. And usually I'll be using my test bench for the videos, but because this is my main card in my main gaming system, I figured I'd just leave it in there. All right guys, so let's put down some baseline figures. What I'm gonna do is I'll do two things before I cut back to you guys. I'm going to run the card um, just looping Unigen Heaven um, and stock settings straight out of the box with nothing touched apart from the fan curve set at 50%. I'm gonna do that both for the stock settings, like how it behaves itself, then I'm gonna overclock it. So I'll get some figures, I'll come back to you guys, we'll do the paste replacement, then we'll do the OC figures and we'll see what happens. So I'll be right back. All right guys, so we're back. We've got the results for the stock paste, both stock clocks and overclocks. So let's go through them. So on the stock clocks, the temperature hit 54 degrees maximum. The core clock itself out of the box with GPU Boost 3 went up to 2000 megahertz neat and just stayed there. The memory is set at 11,000 megahertz, which is the stock value, and that doesn't change. Um, so that wasn't too bad. I'll put an overlay on the screen so it's easier to track as we go through them. Now, I put an overclock on there, so what I did was I maxed out the power target, so 127% power target, 90 degrees uh, Celsius temperature target. I added 65 megahertz to the core. I added 450 megahertz to the memory, so that 
uh, worked out, I also bumped the voltage up by 100% as well. So we maxed out all the sliders obviously, and that took the temperatures to 61 degrees maximum. The core clock jumped up to 2062, and the memory was running at 11,900 megahertz. So that's the stock figures. So let's get on with replacing the thermal paste with the liquid metal um, and come back, run, this, run the tests again and see what happens. All right guys, so we're back with the results after the liquid metal was changed over. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run you through the stock clock results and then the overclock results, um, and we'll see what happens. So uh, with the stock clocks, um, the card was boosting the same as it did before. So core clock was 2000 megahertz, memory clock was 11,000 megahertz, and the temperature maximum was 50 degrees. And it bounced between 49 and 50 quite a bit. So it couldn't make its mind up what it wanted to settle on. So that was a four to five degree drop over the stock paste at the stock clocks. Now, when I overclocked it, and just to remind you, the settings were 127% TDP, plus 100% voltage, 90 degree temp limit, plus 65 on the core, and plus 450 on the memory. So that meant a core clock of 20, uh, sorry, 2062 megahertz, and a memory clock of 11,900 megahertz, and the maximum temperature we hit was 54 degrees. So it was a seven degree drop over the stock paste at the same overclock. So that's a pretty good damn result. Now, what I wanted to point out was, 54 degrees is the temperature that we had stock clock stock paste. So what we've managed to do is basically make this card now run that same temperature with the, the maximum overclock this card can handle, you know, over vaulted, uh, overclocked, and it runs 54 degrees maximum. So that's a pretty damn good result, and I'm really, really happy with that. All right, so let's start to wrap this up. Now, the main point of doing this on this uh, card was to see how well the liquid metal responded in correlation with how effective the cooler is. Now, obviously, what I found, or what I can see is, the better the cooler, the better the liquid metal seems to respond. And that may seem like the most obvious thing anyone's ever said, but, it's interesting because the Titan X that we did it on just seemed to run out of puff and it didn't seem to make that much difference because 
the cooler itself was overwhelmed by the heat regardless of the pace that we put on it. When we put it on this cooler, the FTW3 cooler, which is already an excellent cooler, we saw that the liquid metal was able to function or transition a lot of that heat more out onto the cooler for it to get rid of. So it showed what I hoped it would show. So I'm pretty impressed with that. And running the card overclocked at its limit, 54 degrees max, that's insane. Like that's getting towards water cooling territory, you know, like, you know, mid to high 40s is what water coolers run and you know that's that's just in the distance now and, and you know we're just using an air cooler with some liquid metal some nice thermal compound in between so that's a pretty amazing result one thing i wanted to mention as well was about the warranty now i mentioned it in the uh, the 1080 mini that we did that if you're thinking about doing this you will want to check with the manufacturer of the car whether they allow cooler removal evj have been pretty good with uh, cards in the past, you know they're they're a fan favorite amongst water cooling enthusiasts because they don't mind if you take the cooler off, you know, as long as you don't damage the card. So I dare say, and if any from if anyone from EVGA sees this, feel free to chime in. If doing this to the card void your warranty, let us know. But I, as a guess, I don't think it would. Just again, make sure before you do that that it won't void your warranty because it may not be worth it. I mean, each individual is different. But, you know, for me, I thought it was worth it here, and I don't think it's voided the warranty, so we should be all good. But your results may vary, and your warranty terms may vary as well. So anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in to another video. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this. If there's any other particular cards that you want to see me do liquid metal replacements on, let me know in the comments below. Um, I've got an MSI GTX 1080 Gaming X Plus coming, which I'm hoping to do the same thing to next week. Um, I'd like to know if you guys were keen on seeing that. Uh, I think that would be good because I know the MSI cooler is as effective as this, so it'll be nice to see if we get that same drop on another card with another great cooler, um, just to see how that reacts. So if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, and feel free to list any comments in the section below, and uh, I'll respond to as many as I can, and I'll catch you guys next week in the next one. See ya. Way back home.